Welcome to the Mises Academy podcast. I'm Danny Sanchez, Director of Online Learning at the Mises Institute. I recently appeared on the Tom Woods Show to discuss economic methodology, and I thought you'd like to hear it. A great resource for high schoolers on this topic is An Introduction to Economic Reasoning by David Gordon. You can get a free copy of this book by enrolling yourself or your high schooler in the online course Basics of Economics, Introduction to the Free Market by Robert P. Murphy, which starts in January at academy.mises.org. The book, along with the course, would be a great Christmas gift for the young economist in your family. We're going to turn to our friend Danny Sanchez, because we're going to talk today about how the Austrian economists, members of the Austrian School of Economics, do economics. Because you sometimes hear, oh, the Austrians, they're not scientific. They don't use statistics or whatever. Well, they do use statistics. The question is, what do you use them for? So we're going to talk today to Danny Sanchez, who is the director of the Mises Academy. You all know Mises is spelled M-I-S-E-S. The Mises Academy is the online learning platform of the Mises Institute. And, of course, you can find the Mises Institute at Mises.org and the Mises Academy at academy.mises.org. And he's also the author of many important articles, including the one we're going to be talking about today, Mises on Mind and Method, which is a paper explaining the economic method of Ludwig von Mises. We're going to have a link to that article in the show notes for this episode. So, Danny Sanchez, thanks for taking some time with us today to talk about a sort of complicated but nevertheless important topic. Thank you for having me. I love your show. I've listened to every single episode, and so I'm glad, so glad to be on it. Well, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. Now, let's. I want to talk today, as I said in the introduction here, about this whole question of Austrian economics and is it unscientific and what is, what is Mises' method of doing economics and is this some kind of oddball method that only a weirdo would use? And These are sorts of things that come up on the internet quite a bit, and you get the sense that a lot of people talking about it probably haven't read Mises' epistemological works. Uh, you, get the, you get the sense they've learned it from three sentences they saw quoted by some guy once. So I wanted to get you on here because you've written about this so effectively. And I, I want to explain, first of all, let, let's, let's, I guess, start from the beginning here. Let's explain what is the nature of the the dispute in general. Like, what is this argument all about when it comes down to what Mises believed the econo- or how Mises believed the economist should pursue his craft? What's different between Mises and what the sort of man on the street might think is the way an economist should operate? Well, you mentioned scientific, and that reminds me of a, of a funny thing that happened a, um, a couple years ago. Tom DiLorenzo went uh, to testify to the House Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy, and Congressman William Lacey Clay uh, accused Austrian economics of lacking what he called scientific rigor. And the reason for that was because he said it uses deductive reasoning. So I think it's so funny, this McCarthyite type situation where he's saying, is it true, sir, that you are part of this group of people who use dun-dun-dun logic? <laughs> right. <laughs> we can't have that. Yeah. So, in other words, it's a, it's a question of deductive versus inductive reasoning and a question of which type of reasoning is appropriate to a given discipline. And, and the, the question that Mises is trying to answer is, well, I'm interested in economics. Which approach makes more sense, the approach we would use in geometry or in, in, in legal theory, for example? Or is it better to try to gather data, you know, in the scientific method sort of way and, and, and go into economics sort of agnostic and then see if we can derive general principles from observing empirical data? Is that more or less it? Yes. You, you mentioned geometry, and that's a really important um, comparison because the thing is that people often will say, well, if you are not subjecting your propositions to empirical tests, then basically that's a dogma. And so basically that's a religion, which I wonder if they would accuse geometry of being a religion. I mean, um, geometry also doesn't put its propositions to the test of experiment uh, and of experience in general. Geometry is what is called um, uh, an a prioristic discipline, and that's kind of a, uh, str- a strange word, but basically that means that the theory of geometry 
logically deduced is prior to any kind of experience. So any kind of experience with measurements of objects in reality that the Euclid's elements, the, all the, the system of geometry logically deduced, doesn't depend on the measurements that we take of real-world objects. And it, they, they can't be invalidated by such measurements. And that is not a controversial uh, idea. Um, it's not just Austrian surveyors and Austrian engineers who treat geometry as prior to their, um, to their, um, their use of, um, pr- prior to dealing with real-world objects. Um, so it's not to be just laughed out of court just because it's, um, it's considered prior to ex- experiment. So in other words, nobody would say, hey, you dogmatic geometer, you, you're telling me you believe that the sum of the two sides of a uh, the sum of the squares of the two sides of a right triangle equals the square of the hypotenuse, and you haven't measured a single triangle to verify this. Like, what's the matter with you? Uh, nobody would ask, act that way, right? Nobody would be, uh, frankly, stupid enough to act that way. So the, right. the the question becomes then: Is it appropriate? Like, what is most appropriate? What kind of approach? We, we all see that an empirical approach to geometry makes no sense and is ridiculous and fails to understand the nature of geometry. But why? what would make us think that the nature of economics is such that the method would be similar? Right. There, there really isn't any uh, good reason to think that. Um, because the, the contrast to geometry is the method applied to the natural sciences. And the natural sciences, the phenomena that, that they're describing are characterized by regularity. Um, and, um, but human action is not characterized by um, strict regularity, where, um, where just because you see a phenomena happen on, in certain conditions uh, in the past, it necessarily must happen in the future. And so Mises showed uh, how the character of economics is more akin to geometry, um, especially because just like with geometry, there are certain implications that are bundled up in these basic concepts that everyone introduces into their reasoning. All right, yeah, let, let, me, let me jump in here, because this, this is a good starting point for the whole analysis here. So Mises uses the term a priori, or synthetic a priori, that we can have a statement that's meaningful, and yet that we can know prior to, to all experience. And so the action axiom is an example of the synthetic a priori. So can you explain that? First of all, what's the action axiom, and what do we mean that it's an example of a synthetic a priori statement? And, and by the way, to the people listening today, you had no idea how awesome this podcast was going to be, did you? Now, now you're, you're learning about synthetic a priori statements? I mean, people are just going to love you now. <laughs> well, okay, so, well, um, an a priori uh, statement is something that is um, prior to experience. And the calling it a synthetic a priori statement basically is getting uh, to, towards the fact that it applies to something in the real world. Um, and that is something that is characteristic of Austrian economics, is that um, it's very realistic, that it does apply directly to the real world, as opposed to certain other schools of economics. Now, the action axiom um, basically is that um, um, human action exists, or that man acts. And actually, a funny thing that n- not a lot of people are aware of is that Mises himself never used the, the phrase, uh, the term action axiom. Um, he, he never posited it as a, a proposition that man acts. He called it the, the category of action. So he focused on just the, the concept itself, of action, and um, and what can be um, logically deduced from even thinking in terms of action, uh, in, in any case, and um, and so what can be um, unpacked from the concept of action, and so the thing is that every thinker in social sciences of all schools, not just the Austrian school, that they introduce concepts, especially action, that have certain implications that necessarily follow 
from it. So a lot of people get caught up in phrasing it in terms of the action axiom, and they challenge um, critics of Austrian economics and critics of the free market by first starting off by saying, okay, well, do you think a man acts? And then what happens is that the conversation can get sidetracked in all these sort of meta-philosophical objections and um, ruminations on, on the rationality of man. But really, you don't even have to put that proposition to them. You can just point out that your, uh, your opponent, in his own discussions of human society, is himself positing action. And um, if he is positing action then he has to accept the logical implications that necessarily come from action. So, for example, there are certain things that, uh, without which the idea of action would be incoherent. For example, time. Try to think of an action that didn't involve time. The human mind can't even fathom such a concept. And so time is an implication uh, a, a logical implication of action. Um, also, the the notion of imperfect conditions uh, in light of the actor's judgment, that if a person didn't think that conditions would be imperfect without his intervention, then he wouldn't act. The very notion of a person expecting perfect conditions, with or without his action, actually acting, you can't even imagine why such a person would act. So these are some basic um, logical and necessary implications of action. And any social thinker, uh, social science thinker, who even discusses in terms of action, to be even logically coherent, has to accept these implications. All right, now, maybe to make this a little bit more concrete for people, the other implications of the, of the action axiom, which says that man acts, or that, in other words, that man pursues, uses means to pursue his goals, but people have goals. That's basically what is being said here. There are very clear economic implications of this that everybody can understand. For example, that, that cost exists, because if... Uh, if in every time that I act, I'm implicitly setting aside other things that I might have done. So if I sit here and eat a ham sandwich, I am setting aside uh, flying a plane at this at the same time. Uh, you know, so if I'm if I'm spending my afternoon on a park bench eating a sandwich, I can't also be flying an airplane. So I, I'm I'm choosing and setting aside, and then in choosing and setting aside, I'm demonstrating that I prefer one thing over another. So here we have the idea that there are value scales in my mind, and I have a video online where I start with the action axiom, and I end up showing people how supply and demand curves are derived, where the law of marginal utility comes from, and it all just comes from explaining the implications of the seemingly uninteresting statement that human beings act. Exactly. Um, Mises argued that all means, or, or you could also say goods, are necessarily scarce. And by scarce, he means that the quantity available of the good is outstripped by the goals that a person has in mind for it. Um, so the very concept of using something that is scarce necessarily implies the notion of, as you said, pursuing some ends with it and leaving other ends unpursued. So action with regard to, to scarce means necessarily involves choice, pursuing some ends and setting aside other ends. And a further implication of that is that when a quantity of a good is lost to the actor, then the actor will sacrifice certain ends, certain goals. Now, the goals that are sacrificed are, by definition, valued less than all the goals that he did not sacrifice. And from this reasoning, uh, a thinker can deduce the law of marginal utility. And this law is bound up in the very notions of action, ends, means, and scarcity. 
and you can derive it. And, I'm, and like you said, you derived it in um, in your in your lecture, and that's what Austrian economists are basically doing. Now, is this some freakishly odd thing that only Austrians do, or is in fact can we find in the history of economic thought that maybe I realize I'm stacking the question, but that this was, in fact, the the completely mainstream approach to doing economics until quite recently. Yes, Mises argued that throughout the history of economic thought, this is basically the method that economists largely pursued, even though in their writings on methodology, where they're talking about methodology, they don't necessarily endorse it. But in practice, when the kind of reasoning that they were doing is theoretical reasoning like we're discussing here. Um, and, um, and there are examples of some um, economists prior to the Austrian school that actually were pretty much explicit praxeologists. So praxeology is um, this idea of just theorizing from the basic concept of action. Um, and Rothbard, Murray Rothbard, covers uh, some of these examples in his... Um, um, Austrian perspective on economic thought treatise, which is a fascinating read. Um, another thing that you might think that a lot of this is just very vague uh, and very general. So, okay, so if you just think about just the general concept of action, that you can come up with um, very, very general conclusions, but how does that help us in studying the complex world where it's not just that you know that people are acting, but that you know that people are acting in certain ways. But that's also part of praxeology for Mises, because what we need to do is then think about certain modes of action. Um, and so we need to um, restrict our notion of action by, by certain assumptions. And, and we think of different um, ways in which people can act. So, for example, people can think of interpersonal exchange. And so that's not a property of all human action, that you can imagine sort of a Robinson Crusoe just sitting on this island and he has no one to exchange with. Um, but you can um, posit uh, certain assumptions about what you're theorizing about, and you can say, okay, let's say that there's another person. Let's say that Friday is on the island with him, and they can um, interpersonally exchange. Now, there are some logical implications to where even just thinking about that restricted kind of action necessarily has certain logical implications. So, for example, one logical implication is that both Crusoe and Friday... Um, mutually benefit or ex or expect to mutually benefit from the exchange. Because if they didn't expect to, mu to benefit, why would they do the exchange anyway? But by definition, they expect to benefit. So that's one thing that you can know just from the very concept of exchange necessarily must be true. And then, like you said you do in your lecture, that you could take um, the concept of exchange apply the law of marginal utility to that and other concepts, and then, for example, derive the law of demand. And you can um, use that kind of reasoning to construct price theory and then use the reasoning uh, of price theory to construct a profit and loss theory. And so this is the way Austrian economists operate. Now, what about the objection that people will say, yeah, 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 this sounds fine and everything, but the real problem with you Austrians is that you're so dogmatic in your beliefs because of your so-called praxeology and your deductive reasoning and all this fancy stuff that you won't even admit statistics into your analysis. I mean, really, what kind of thinker doesn't even use statistics? Now, is it true that Austrians just belligerently refuse to use statistics? Like, what exactly is the relationship between Austrians and statistics? Well, they do use statistics for economic history. They don't use statistics to support their theory, um, but they use theory in combination with statistics to understand what actually happened in the past. 
And so this gets at um, the comparison between um, geometry and, um, and economics. So let's say that um, a geometry teacher assigns you to derive the measurements of an archaeological ruin. And this part of this ruined building happens to have the, um, the characteristics of a right triangle on one of its faces. And now let's say that you only are able to directly measure certain parts of the ruin. Um, and the geometry teacher assigns you the task of using the, laws, the, the theorems of geometry to derive the other measurements. Now, let's say that, um, that you do that, you, um, and then you find out that the measurements don't jibe with your understanding of the Pythagorean theorem. And you return to the teacher to denounce the orthodoxy and dogma of Pythagoras and to proclaim your um, heterodox rival um, uh, theorem about um, right triangles that is based on your measurements of this ruin. Now, that is akin to if an Austrian economics teacher assigned you to gather statistics um, to, um, to help you in uh, economic history. But then, when you gather your t- statistics, you decide that you think that this doesn't jibe with Austrian economic theory. And so you go back to your teacher and you say, I have, um, denou- I- I'm-, I'm denouncing the orthodoxy and dogma of, of Mises and Rothbard. Um, and-, and then you try to have your own alternative theory just based on, on your statistics. Now, if you think about the way that every geometry teacher would respond to that student, it gives you an idea of the way that uh, an Austrian economist would respond to a similar student. So there are a few possibilities that both, um, uh, both students are making fundamental errors. For the geometry student, for example, maybe he doesn't actually know the Pythagorean theorem. Maybe he tried to derive it in a certain way, and he messed up. Um, he, he didn't reason correctly. And so he decides that he thinks that the Pythagorean theorem is that a squared plus b squared equals c cubed, for example. And so that's why his measurements don't jibe with what he thinks of as the Pythagorean theorem, because he doesn't actually know the Pythagorean theorem. He, he derived it. Um, incorrectly. And so let's say that he actually measures the artifact, and from his measurements, he finds out that in that one case, a squared plus b squared did equal c squared. Well, that gives him a clue that his reasoning was faulty. But those measurements themselves do not substitute for correcting the reasoning itself. You can't just say, I know now that a squared plus b squared equals c squared because I did these measurements. What you have to do is use that as a hint and then go back to your desk and your, your pencil and paper and then, re- and then derive the correct Pythagorean theorem using validly reasoned proofs. Okay? Now, the parallel of that is an Austrian economist who... Um, doesn't actually know the correct theory that he, in, in trying to derive his own theory that he, um, he reasoned incorrectly. And so, so that's the problem, is that, um, and that's why that statistics don't jive with his theory, because his theory is wrong, and he needs to correct his theory through re-reasoning it. He can't just rely on the statistics. Now, another possibility is that it's not a right triangle at all. So maybe the Pythagorean theorem doesn't even apply. Maybe it's not even relevant to the situation that he's considering. And so that would be equivalent to um, applying uh, an irrelevant theory to a certain economic set of statistics. So maybe um, if you, for example, try to apply the theory of economic calculation to barter, uh, barter society, when it doesn't even apply because 
economic calculation only applies to a market society, for example. So basically what that means is that so every uh, logical proof has premises and a conclusion, but the conclusion is only certain if the premises are given. And so his problem with um, the fact that he's not even dealing with a right triangle is that the premises involved in the Pythagorean theorem aren't even given in the situation. So, of course, the, the conclusion of the Pythagorean theorem doesn't apply to this particular situation. Um, and finally, another possibility, of course, is that the student just mismeasured. So the, the student just made um, a, had human error in trying to take the measurements of the, of the um, artifact, and, um, th- and that's similar to just bad economic statistics. Well, Danny Sanchez, uh, we're just about out of time, so I appreciate you guiding us through what it, you know what may seem tricky to the beginner, but you know, if you read uh, Mises' stuff on this, is actually not impossibly difficult to, to manage, and on the TomWoodsRadio.com site, next to this particular program, we're going to make sure and link to your article specifically on Mises on Mind and Method, which will help people to understand these sorts of things and then sort of inoculate themselves against some of the ill-informed attacks that you might encounter online from time to time. So, Danny, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And just to mention that in that article, the the ideas that I I referenced in this interview, um, I I link them to particular quotes in Mises' works uh, where he makes these uh, points. So, Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Okay, thanks. Thank you for listening to the Mises Academy podcast. To enroll in online courses, to access other episodes of this podcast, or for more information, visit academy.mises.org.